Hello, welcome to Music Ally Focus with me, Music Ally's editor, Joe Sparrow. And if you love licensing, then this is the episode for you. In this episode, we're joined by Chris Aron, CEO of the Mechanical Licensing Collective, and he gives us an overview of the big issues in mechanical licensing in 2023. He talks about data transparency as well and looks ahead to the next evolution for songwriters and in publishing royalties. All of that coming up in about one minute. Now, each Music Ally Focus episode analyzes one meaningful music business story at a time, just like this one, and so this podcast is going to be quick. It should take about the same amount of time as Ronald's Sarchian could hypothetically smash 1,250 pumpkins. Ronald smashed 52 in one minute in 2020, and this record was equaled by our old friend and record breaker Ashrita Furman on the very same day. And for those of you keeping count... That's 104 pumpkins between the two of them. Now, talking of pumpkins, aren't you glad that we have the MLC's Chris Arend on the show, who chatted to me about the state of mechanical licensing in 2023, the big issues from the MLC's perspective, and the changes he'd like to see happen. He also talks about data transparency, what he thinks artists and songwriters really want, and what the MLC are doing to increase clarity for them. He also addresses the recent Copyright Royalty Board and Fono Record 3 final determination and has some thoughts on what the streaming royalty space will look like in five to ten years' time. Let's go over to Chris right now. So I'm very happy to welcome the CEO of the Mechanical Licensing Collective, Chris Arend, to the podcast. Hi, Chris. Hey, Joe. Great to be here. Uh, thanks for joining us. Now, we're going to have a look at a sort of we're going to take a bit of a sort of snapshot of where we're at with mechanical licensing in, in 2023 and look forwards as well. But before we get into that, can you give us some of the basics just for context, who you are, what you do at the MLC, and for the benefit of our international audience, what the MLC does in a sort of broad sense? Sure. Um, well, as you said, I'm the CEO of the MLC. Uh, that stands for the Mechanical Licensing Collective. Um, we are a relatively new collective management organization in the United States. And um, for your viewers outside the U.S., we uh, look like um, a lot of the CMOs that um, you have had um, around the world for um, upwards of 100 years. Um, so we collectively manage um, and administer a set of royalties for songwriters and publishers, specifically digital audio mechanicals, generated from uses of songs in the U.S. market only. So it's pretty specific, but that's obviously a, a giant piece of the market in the U.S. And um, because there are songs uh, in the U.S. market that have been written by writers from all around the world, we are collecting and distributing royalties to songwriters and their partners um, literally in 100 plus countries around the world. Right. Okay. So obviously, like you say, it's a uh... It sort of feels niche, but also it's a huge part of the business at the same time. It's, it's one of those important uh, parts of the machine. We want to just chat to you, really, and, and get an idea of what's going on right now and what's going to happen next for songwriters and their mechanical royalties and what they're looking for. Because as you say, it's, you're dealing with an international base of uh, songwriters and you know, rights holders. So first of all, can you give us a sort of... <clears throat> Like if you like a snapshot overview of mechanical licensing in 2023. First of all, what are the big issues in mechanical licensing from the MLC's perspective right now? Sure. Uh, I think awareness and understanding are always uh, great places to start. Um, something that perhaps gets overlooked is um, as the business has uh, moved from uh, a physical goods model to a digital model, um, where we now have a limited inventory, we literally have millions of creators who have full access to the global music market. And um, and that was not the case in our lifetime, Joe, as you know. Um, and, and so what that means is we now have millions of people who um, need to understand how the business side of the business works. Um, so something as simple as um, the fact that um, creators, songwriters in this case, are entitled to receive mechanical royalties when their songs are streamed on interactive streaming services. Um, there are probably millions of creators who don't understand what mechanicals are or the fact that they're entitled to those royalties when their works are streamed on those big services. So we've got to build that awareness, that understanding of the business side of the business 
among a, a vastly larger group of people um, than traditionally we needed to when our business model was selling records in physical formats uh, in record stores um, back in the days when the gatekeepers decided who, who got to the market. I think uh, the other uh, big issues re revolve around data. So uh, we obviously need data and information about those millions of creators and the songs that they've created. And, um, and we also need really good comprehensive data um, on the sound recording side and ideally um, at least some clue uh, into the connection or the link between the song that has been recorded um, and the sound recording that features that song. So um, there's data that we need from the rights holders themselves and then there's data we need about the sound recordings that feature their songs. And, um, and that's a, a, a huge and ongoing uh, challenge for the industry uh, globally. So, like you said, the, the, the MLC is a fairly recent uh, body, if you like. It's, it's, it's only been around for a few years. Um, in that time, and maybe more recently, what, what are the big improvements that you've seen and the successes that you, you count for the MLC? Sure. I think simply setting things up um, and getting the MLC up and running um, was a huge challenge and a huge accomplishment. Um, for our industry, and and we did that in the middle of a global pandemic, which was a terrible time to yeah. start up a new system for anything. Um, but but we certainly see in the metrics that that we have uh, accomplished that. We have more than thirty thousand members. We have data for uh, more than thirty two million works in our database. We've completed thirty monthly royalty distributions, and each one of them has been on time or early. And uh, something that I expect we'll get into a little bit more, but um, through the tools that we've created and the um, uh, the transparency that we offer, we have effectively illuminated the black box of unpaid royalties in this part of the business, which I think is a huge uh, step forward. When you hear from songwriters, then you know what do they say to that? Because they've they, you know they've you've got songwriters perhaps who've been songwriters for forty years and they've been dealing with the before. And then the after. So, what what have they noticed apart from those big things you've just mentioned? What what? How do they feel that the effects of that? Well, there, there are lots of different things. I, I think fundamentally, um, all of us are um, to some degree working through the challenges of a massive shift in the business model. You know, when we were selling products, we were effectively recognizing the value of those products upfront, meaning the lifetime value. Uh, much in the way that when you buy a car, you pay up front for the full value of that car, um, even though you may drive that car for the next 10 years, right? You pay up front and then you use the car for the next 10 years. Music was similar. We were buying records and effectively buying the right to listen to those records for the rest of our lives and prepaying for that lifetime right um, up front uh, in that initial transaction. Now we're in a consumption model where consumers are paying um, for the right to listen to music one stream at a time, and they're obviously paying a fraction of the amount uh, for each stream that they would pay um, in the older model when they were buying music. So uh, that alone has had um, enormous um, impacts on uh, the business and the way that um, all of us um, work in the business, make a living in the business. Um, so I think that's an ongoing uh, challenge for songwriters that we hear about a lot. And then I think the, the, the data piece of it and uh, the fact that um, as a songwriter, you may have written songs for the last 30 years. Um, and again, in a sale-based business, there were only a handful of songs you had written that were available on records for purchase at any given moment. Now your entire songwriting catalog and all the recordings that have ever been made of those songs um, can and likely is available um, globally. Uh, and so you need to have all of the information about all of those songs uh, readily available. And then you have to be able to communicate that to all the organizations that pay you. So um, it's just a, a massive shift from the way the business ran before. And, and that, that requirement, if you will, that, that you have a headline on your data is for many creators, I think, uh, a, a new challenge, not something that traditionally they may have thought as much about, but, but certainly now is something that's fundamental to their success. Hmm. 
Now, at this point, let me just take a moment to remind you that last year, Music Ally launched a series of five free courses covering everything you need to know about Amazon Music for Artists, including programming and curation, selling artist merchandise, understanding voice technology, reaching audiences via Alexa, and live streaming on Twitch. Supported by Amazon Music, these courses are all completely free to access. And now, thanks to Amazon's support, Music Ally is also able to offer complimentary certification to any individual or company that completes all five of the courses. So what have you got to lose? Nothing, that's what, because they're all free. So you can find a link to the Amazon Music for Artists series in our show notes beneath the podcast. Um, you mentioned transparency earlier, and you know, we hear artists asking for transparency all the time across the music industry in various different ways, with, with various different connecting points, but in, in particular around streaming data, fan data, and royalty data. You know, they, that's where they really want transparency. So th- my next sort of set of questions really is about from your perspective, why transparency is so important and why it's still kind of elusive in these places. So what, what you mentioned it, you mentioned transparency in your technologies earlier. What, what is the MLC doing about transparency? How does that, how does that transparency reach songwriters? Yeah. Um, it starts with something as simple as making all of the data that we have um, for the songs in our database available to be searched for free using our public search. Um, you can go to our website, www.emlc.com, and search uh, to see what data we have on any song of that 32 plus million in the database. Um, uh, it then continues with uh, the tools that we make available to members that allow them to search not only that data, but the data um, for the sound recording uses that we have not been able to match to a song. So again, when I refer to illuminating the black box, what I mean by that is um, to the extent that we are not able to make the connection between the streams um, that are reported to us uh, based on the sound recording data, and then the song that that sound recording features, we make that data available to every one of our members to search for free to look for sound recordings that feature their songs. And by giving rights holders, um, members, the ability to look at that unmatched data um, in the same way that we look at it, we increase the likelihood that we'll make those connections because now we have, you know, 32,000 eyes, we have 32,000 members, um, at least 32,000 sets of eyes looking at that that data in addition to our team trying to make those connections. Um, And then beyond that, we are um, continuing to build and uh, and offer tools that allow members to uh, export the data that we create um, during the course of the work we do so that they can have access to it. So for example, today, any one of our members can export their catalog of song data um, into an Excel compatible format. They can do that automatically with our member portal real time. It's a fully automated process. Um, And they can also search um, and filter that data. So if you're a publisher and you want to export just the data for the songs um, in your catalog that were written by one of your writers, you search for that writer's name, that filters your catalog down to just the songs that feature that writer in the writer field. And now you can export um, a file that just has the data for the songs written by that writer. So the the point is making it as easy as possible for rights holders to access the data that they provide to companies like us so that they can use it not only to improve the data we have, but also so they can send it to other organizations that pay them. Um, you, You asked why is transparency so elusive? And part of it um, stems from the fact that for, for many years, if not decades, most companies in the industry that accumulated data viewed the data as a proprietary resource. And so they weren't willing to share that data um, with others, um, including the creators of the works about which um, the data related. So we um, are taking a different approach. That approach was dictated by the law that led to our creation, and that is to make the data that we um, capture um, as readily available as possible. We do that to our members in certain ways that allow them to action it, and then we do that for the broader public as well. And by making data um, more readily available, um, we will hopefully improve transparency um, in the part of the business we operate in 
and perhaps encourage other organizations in other parts of the world to do the same. So there's a few things there, it, and to, I, I can see you're helpful. I mean, I've spoken to artists and particularly managers of artists, and they're saying, oh, you know, I spend you know uh, time trying to match things up and recover stuff out of the black box. And it's by its very nature, it's really difficult and frustrating. It, it's a black box after all. So, I mean, what, what sort of, what are your hopes for that then in terms of aligning the rights and getting payments to happen? Do you have any sort of, can you, can you put a, any sort of, maybe a, a figure or a sort of target on it of how you would like that efficiency to improve there? Sure. Um, I don't know if I'd put a figure on it, but I, but I think the, the way that we improve um, the system and, and make it more accurate and um, ensure that more money gets out is by engaging every rights holder as much as we can. Um, the system will work better if all of us are engaged in it, all of us are looking at the data, um, all of us are involved in trying to connect those, those gaps. Um, and that's true in part because, um, you know, we are a creative business and the, the, the lifeblood of our business are these creative works that start in, in places where the first priority is not to capture data, right? The first priority is to be creative. So after that creative moment happens, after the creative work um, comes into existence, then um, we all want to be a part of making sure we attach to those creative works as much data as we can. Um, that really involves creating a culture um, that that prioritizes this, right? Um, so uh, we we want uh, artists and writers um, to be actively engaged in in aspects of this process. A great question that uh, I like to ask songwriters when when I meet with them is, "Do you know how many songs you have written that have been recorded and are now available in the digital marketplace?" And we'll start with the U.S. because that's again where we administer rights. Um, every songwriter should know that number because that number represents the number of works um, for which they are entitled to be paid. And if you don't know the number, then there's a decent chance that you're not going to get paid for all those works in part because neither you nor any partner you might engage will be looking for all of the things that are in the market that you've written. So something as simple as knowing that number is a great start. Um, and then obviously, you know, providing the, the information about the people you write with, um, to your partners or writing that down, um, you know, somewhat contemporaneously with the time that, you know, you spent writing, just keeping good notes is a good practice, um, agreeing on splits, um, you know, not in the moment when you're writing, but shortly thereafter, so that six months after the fact, when that song gets cut for the first time, you're not trying to recreate what happened. Um, things like that, building a culture where we recognize that data is going to drive our ability to get paid, or as we say, data drives the dollars, uh, but also data drives discovery, right? Good data attached to your works is how people find those works. In a market with 100 plus million sound recording products, um, the data is fundamental to being found, and we want to be found. We want creators to be found. So um, again, um, that, that engagement is imperative for many reasons. And the more people um, who are engaged, the better the outcomes um, will be. Let's talk about some of the other things that's going on that the MLC are involved with at the moment. And um, there's an interesting recent case around uh, late fees from streaming platforms. Um, can you, again, sort of for the benefit of international listeners who perhaps are sort of tangentially aware of this, can you explain what that was? And is that and and how the MLC was involved with that? And is that an example of transparency working well? Um, yeah, that that was a somewhat narrow issue, um, and it stems from the fact that the rate formulas that apply in the US um, allow for the possibility that a service at the time they have to provide their data to the MLC will not have finalized all of the information. Um, that they need to report. And, and so in that situation, they're allowed to use estimates. Um, those estimates uh, eventually have to be trued up to reflect the actual um, data. But if that happens and uh, at a point in the future, they then owe more royalties, the issue that we were discussing was should those additional royalties be subject to late fees? 
We thought the law pretty clearly stated yes. Um, the services were not as confident in that outcome and, and, and wanted that to be considered by the Copyright Office. Copyright Office reviewed it and essentially agreed that the law was pretty clear on that point. So um, what it means is if a service uses estimates and later has to um, pay additional royalties, they would allay fees for those royalties. The net effect of that is it will likely encourage services to um, calculate those estimates estimates in a way that um, is favorable to rights holders, meaning they won't um, make estimates that are conservative and favor them, um, knowing that if they do that, and then they eventually have to pay additional royalties, they'll have to pay late fees on them. So that was the issue. And, um, and it's good to have it resolved just because that's a part of our process that we we want to um, build for and 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 make sure there's no doubt about, um, and then it allows us to be transparent with writers because when we do collect late fees and we distribute those to members, we identify those on statements. So it's less a transparency issue and more just an alignment issue, making sure that we were all aligned on how that sort of worked so we can build it operationally. I mean, this this is a sort of I, I guess this is a I guess this is a a sort of where trust meets business in the sense. Um, in that sense, because you've got the transparency when songwriters want it, um, it's because they they want to feel that they're getting the right deal, and you are providing this transparency. I guess it, it, in part to engender that trust in in your songwriters, and then of course another example of this is the with the copyright royalty board and the the phono record. Three determination recently, which again we're getting in the weeds of sort of uh, uh, sort of complex uh, local um, setting of royalty rates and things here. But I mean, th- there's a there's a big chunk of money that's due for songwriters and rights holders as a result of that from a period like about a year and a half, I think, when the MLC was not yet operating. So this is something that you've got to you've got to negotiate that in the past perhaps would not have been quite so transparent. How do you, how are you going to do, is that the same kind of approach? Are you going to do the same thing of keeping it very open so people know what's going on? Absolutely. And every, everything that, that we, um, all the royalties we distribute, uh, we identify clearly on the statements in the detail um, so the members know exactly what they're getting. Um, so when we process blanket royalties, they're clearly identified as blanket royalties. And those That's how we refer to the royalties that we now administer. Um, for the historical royalties that that originated from uses that predated the MLC, when we were able to match and distribute those, we identify those clearly on the statement as historical royalties. So um, all of this um, we do in a very clear and transparent way that's intended to let rights holders see exactly what they're getting. In terms of the photo three rates, um, that refers to a five-year period um, during which um, the rates were initially set, the digital services um, appeal to those rates, and then the federal appeals courts um, effectively remanded the rate proceeding back to this copyright royalty board that sets the rates for further consideration. And that whole process um, essentially took beyond the five-year window during which the rates were supposed to apply. Um, so that five-year period uh, stretched from 2018 to 2022. Um, for the first three years of it, 18, 19, and 20, um, the MLC was not yet operational. Um, the law creating us was only passed in 2018. And so um, services will need to adjust uh, the royalties that they paid directly to rights holders for those three years um, to reflect the final rates. And that could result in an incremental payment or a, a take back of royalties, depending on how they initially paid those out. Um, those services will also have to correct the data they transfer to us for those historical unmatched royalties from 2018, 19, and 20 that they transferred to us. Once we get that corrected or adjusted data, then we'll be able to begin paying out the matched royalties for those three years. And then the services will have to correct the royalties that they um, provided to us for 2021 20, and 22, the first two years of the MLC's operations. And, um, and again, once we receive the data um, for those adjustments, then we'll be able to process um, whatever changes are are due. Um, and, and there will certainly be incremental royalties owed to rights holders as a result of that. It's not clear exactly how much, um, but, um, but we'll certainly see that all come into focus next year. The deadline for the services to deliver their revised data to us is in February 2024. Um, so we hope 
uh, within three months after that to begin um, paying out the matched historical royalties for those last uh, three years before we came online and then begin processing the adjustments as well, um, call it mid to late spring of next year. Right. I mean, yeah, I get, I get the feeling that, that you sort of, you have this sort of the, the issue of having to move necessarily very slowly because of the size of the data and the, and the amount of data and the, and also historical, you know, these kind of things like the fun of record judgments and things take a long time to happen, as you said, but at the same time, you, you're sort of bound by the, the need to move quickly and pay on time and all those kind of things. It's, uh, it sounds tricky. Yeah. We, we move very quickly, but yes, things like the setting of rates can move quite slowly. And, um, and, and so that's, you know, there's some tension there for sure. But, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're accounting on a monthly basis within 75 days after the end of a month. So um, royalties flow quickly and effectively um, in a relatively short period of time. Um, more quickly than they do in many parts of the business today where you still might see quarterly or even semi-annual accounting. And it's certainly not, you know, within 75 days, sometimes those could be quarterly on a five or six month lag. Um, so you're, you're not seeing royalties for, you know, nine plus months after um, the period being reported ends. So let's, let's look forwards a bit then. We've talked about changes that are happening now. We've talked about different approaches around transparency and technology. So I'm sort of interested in where songwriter and publishing royalties go in terms of what the expectations are and, and what people are trying to deliver. So, well, what else do songwriters and publishers want? I mean, they, they want to get paid faster. I'm sure they they want transparency. But what, what other things do they do, do they want that you are hoping to deliver? I think all of us want better processes at, at the very front end of the process um, to capture both. Um, as much information about the songwriters and the songs as possible, and then also the links between the sound recordings that feature those songs and the songs, right? When you think about it, any recording that is made, at the moment it is recorded, the performers know the song that they're performing. Um, and yet we don't do a good job of capturing the information about that song that's being performed for the recording um, or linking the data for the song to the data for the sound recording at the front end of the process. That is something I think all of us want to see improve. And, um, and there are lots of uh, folks that are exploring ways to do that. Some of it involves, um, you know, building that capability into the workstations that we now frequently use to record music. Um, some of it involves um, the independent sound recording distributors doing more to require uh, more data from their customers um, at the point of delivery, um, the same as I was true for record companies, and then the services themselves, um, you know, continuing to ensure that they are passing through to us and other organizations like us um, every bit of the data they receive from those upstream partners so that none of it is lost in the process. Um, if we can get to a point where we have that data and those links established early, then much more of the royalties that flow through the process to organizations like the MLC um, will be able to pay be paid um, quickly and accurately. Um, but in the absence of that data, um, it can be incredibly difficult. Um, and that's the challenge that we face right now is trying to uh, make up for those gaps in the data or the poor data quality um, that we receive um, from the DSTs that often originates um, even before they're involved. This is an interesting problem, isn't it? Because it's one that people are trying to solve in different ways. And it's, it's partially technology and partially education, I guess, because like you know, you can build th you can build things into doors, and you know, you know, and, and when it make sure that lesser data is baked in early. But th there's always ways of forgetting or avoiding doing that. So, but as you say, at the moment of inception, when you're being creative and you don't think about that, maybe or maybe you're you're you're, you're 18, you certainly don't think about that. You know, you just want to make good music. So how do you how do you make sure that uh, you know this there's a change in that education to get people to to do this. Um, there's there's no one thing. I think it requires you know all of us that work in the industry, every organization, doing as much uh, outreach and education as possible to explain um, how things work and the importance of data. I think for younger creators today, it's a much easier proposition for them to get their heads around because 
they have grown up as digital natives. Um, I think for creators who have been around for a bit, um, it's it's harder because it, it represents um, both the change in the way the business worked and then a shift toward um, computers and technology that they may not be as comfortable with in their personal lives. Um, but all of us have to, I think, get to the point where we understand that the system now, the industry is fueled by data. Um, and, and that is not because um, the music creation is you know, moving to technology or becoming AI. It's because of the volume of, 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 of things in the business. Again, in a global music market where the same 100 plus million uh, soundboarding products can be available in every market around the world, 100 plus markets, um, and there can be tens of millions of songs in those 100 plus million sound recordings, um, there's no way for that to function effectively without um, a really strong foundation of, of, of best um, practices around data management. And that has to involve everybody. Now, for us as an industry, we have to find ways to make it easy um, and seamless for the, the folks that aren't as technically minded. And you know, the example that I often use, it's it's no different than your bank card. Um, you know, all of us um use bank cards to get cash to the extent we need cash out of cash machines. Um, that's maybe um dwindling now as we all ship to our apps on our phones. But the point is for many, many years, we all learned how to participate in the global financial system um, by using a card to access our money. And the first couple of times you did it, it was very foreign. And I was like, wow, is this going to work? And am I really going to pay for you know a pack of gum using a credit card? But we got over that and, and all of us moved to that system. And that's why use of cash is diminishing because we got comfortable with it. And we don't think about what's embedded in those cards, the data, the information that's embedded in it, but but all of that information is what allows those transactions to flow seamlessly across the world, so that we are able to spend our money freely wherever we want, and all of that gets reflected accurately in our bank accounts. Um, music needs to have a similar model where we want to make sure that the music can move freely throughout the world to every person in the world who wants to listen to it, and then the information we need to make sure that the financial consequence of that consumption, meaning whatever money is generated when that fan listens to the music gets all the way back to the people who created the music. It is absolutely possible, but it's going to require a lot of work on the part of every single person in the organization in the industry. Um, all of us can and need to do more. And um, and that's you know where we are today. But I'm optimistic. I think there's, there's great opportunity. Um, and I think there's more and more interest in this every day. Um, and you know, I hope that the MLC is playing a part of that. Mm. Well, I've, sort of with that in mind, then as a final question, how do, how do you think that the streaming royalty space, or how do you hope that the streaming royalty space will look in in the future, in sort of say five years' time? Hopefully, you've maybe progressed towards this goal. What what would what would a successful what would a successful period of time look like? In in that, that? I, I certainly would love to see more um, more writer data and the links between sound recordings and musical works songs uh, captured at the very front end of that value chain. Um, I think uh, I would love to see far easier ways for creators to register their works, claim their shares, manage their data. And that's something that we're pushing on a lot, trying to make our tools and our processes as user-friendly as possible for um, the least sophisticated users, right? It's easy to build technical tools for highly technical people. We want to build tools that are intuitive for creatives so that they can manage all of this themselves easily should they choose. Um, we need that awareness to continue to grow. And I also think we, we need to see um, um, the increase in roles um, that deal with data. So, for example, um, you know, many years ago when social media was in, in its infancy, the idea that a company or a creator would have a social media manager was a very new concept. Mm -hmm. And I still remember working at, a, at a, a company in the industry the first time we hired somebody whose job was to manage our social media platforms. And we all thought like, wow, like that's the job now to manage the company's Facebook page. But of course, today we, we don't question that. And every company has teams of people that manage their presence on social media because it's such an important part of our business. I would like to think in five years, you will see many more data managers working throughout the industry, not just at the companies or the big companies, but small companies and um, in the creators' teams themselves, where creators will recognize that 
data is fundamental to my business. And so if, if I'm successful enough to have a team of people working with me, one of the people on that team is going to be a data manager. And their sole focus is going to be making sure that um, all the partners I have have all of the information they need about the works I've created to make sure that I get paid. Um, the last thought I'll leave you with, Joe, is uh, uh, there's a lot of talk right now about AI and, um, and how that will impact the creative process. And those are really important discussions. We can't move away from a business where um, human creativity um, is the bedrock of what we do. It needs to continue to be the foundation of what we do. But I would love to see us find ways to leverage AI to solve some of the data issues. And I think that's the place where all of us would agree if we can um, use AI to fill those gaps of the data um, that exist in an automated way, um, that would be a great uh, application for that technology. So I, I hope we'll see that as well. Hmm, good. Yes, I was going to. I was going to su suggest that perhaps that would be the, uh, the, uh, the something that could shine light in the black box and, and match those things up. It'd be interesting to see uh, how that actually pans out as we as AI is evolving so quickly. Um, Chris, thanks. Thanks for your time. Before you go, one final question. We've talked a lot about metadata. Let's talk about the the main piece of data in the center, the music. Uh, just for a bit of context, if you could only pick one piece of music to listen to for the rest of your life, what would it be? Uh, that's, uh, that's really tough. I think that I answered that question uh, a few years ago. Um, it was framed as if you were on a desert island. And, um, yeah. and in that context, I thought that Phil Collins, Take Me Home, was a, <laughs> was a great question. It was a favorite song of mine as a, as a kid. And uh, and if I was stuck on an island, that's certainly what I'd be thinking about. So I'll, I'll go with that today, too. I think that makes a lot of sense. Good rationale. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Chris Aron from the, the MLC, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Chuck. Appreciate it. Okay, that's it. Big thanks again to Chris Arendt. And uh, you can check out the links below the podcast for the things he was talking about and more information on the MLC. If you found that podcast useful, please do share it on with someone else who you think will get something out of it. And if you'd like to get in touch with me, I would love to hear from you. You can email me as ever at joe, J-O-E, at musically.com. We also have a free weekly email called The Knowledge, which rounds up bits and pieces of the best analysis, news, marketing insight, and skills from Music Ally, and pumps them into your inbox every Friday afternoon. So you can find the link below the podcast as ever, and you can sign up and impress your boss. All right, that's it. Thanks for listening. I've been Music Ally's Joe Sparrow. You have been you. And until next time, farewell.